final leg in these two years of travels took a delegation led by Imam Muhammad to Palestine and the holy city of Jerusalem. It is here that Imam Muhammad received his biggest reception ever. On December the 18th, 1996, Imam Dimadine Muhammad and his five member delegation, which included Imam Clement El Amin, Imam Omar Shaheed, Ronald Shaheed, Muslim Journal editor Aisha Mustafa, and myself, left New York City and flew to Jerusalem. Imam Muhammad was responding to an invitation from the Palestinian Authority President Yasser Arafat. Almost 14 hours later, we landed at Ben Gurion International Airport in Tel Aviv and were met by Sheikh Ali Sade, who hugged Imam Muhammad saying, This is your home, your house, your country. And arm in arm, he escorted Imam Muhammad as his delegation followed to waiting vans which took us to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is less than one hour's drive from the city of Tel Aviv, which the Muslims call Eilat, and is some 3,000 years old. Upon arriving at the hotel, Imam Muhammad was received by a line of dignitaries so distinguished all other receptions received in other countries paled in comparison. Boys dressed in their scouts' uniforms saluted Imam Muhammad and his delegation as young Muslim girls presented us with flowers. This is customary for guests as important and significant to addressing national and international problems as Imam Muhammad. The Al-Quds Al-Sharif scouts performed the Palestinian national anthem proudly displaying the Palestinian flag. We stayed at Hotel Seven Arches, which sits upon the top of the Mount of Olives, overlooking the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Yes, it is the same mount described in the Bible as the mount facing Jerusalem and is the scene of the flight of Prophet David, the triumphal progress of Prophet Solomon, the son of David, and the place of the agony and betrayal of Christ Jesus. The Mount of Olives is in East Jerusalem, which is the Muslim section of the city. It is the very mount which the Bible says Christ Jesus stayed when teaching in the temples of Jerusalem. In the Bible, according to St. Luke 21 and 37, and in the daytime, he, Christ Jesus, was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount called the Mount of Olives. From our rooms we could see much of the city of Jerusalem in the daytime and the beautiful twinkling skyline of bright lights at night. We could also see the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque clearly from Imam Muhammad's room and the view was quite spectacular. <laughs> About 4.50 a.m. Friday morning, Juma Day, the sound that awakens hundreds of millions of Muslims worldwide awakened us. The melodic recitation of Quran, followed about 15 minutes later by Adhan. This most beautiful of all wake-up calls could be heard all over East Jerusalem from all the mosques with the loudest and clearest coming from the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque. This was our first morning in the city of Jerusalem, which the Muslims call Al-Quds, meaning the Holy. The first person we saw this morning was our tour guide and interpreter, Ali Jeddah. He is a second generation African from Chad and speaks four languages fluently, Arabic, English, French, and Hebrew. He can translate from each of these languages to any of the others while in conversation. Plus, he has communicative skills in six others. 
he is very much sought after as a tour guide. Ali spent 17 years in prison as a freedom fighter for the Palestinian cause. He calls himself a black Palestinian and notes that he has never felt any prejudice from his Palestinian brothers. His father, Abu Ali, is more than 100 years old. He is chief imam of a mosque and is the respected leader in the African quarters, which is within the shopping area of Al-Aqsa Mosque. The day began with a tour of the old city, which in everyday language is called East Jerusalem. West Jerusalem is where most Jewish people of the area reside, and it is more modern because of the imported U.S. tax dollars spent to demolish neighborhoods that were formerly Palestinian. The Jews have built new businesses, office buildings, and residences for immigrant Jewish settlers from Europe. They do not accept the Falashas from Ethiopia and the black Hebrews from America as legitimate settlers. At the entrance to the walled city where the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque are found, we saw our first signs of Israeli occupation and its results. In 1990, 17 men and boys and two women were massacred by Israeli stormtroopers. The Palestinians buried them at the gate of the area that leads to Al-Aqsa Mosque. It is an incident that all Muslims will remember for all times. The Israelis still stationed soldiers, mostly young teenage looking boys, outside the gate leading into the mosque area carrying machine guns. We went inside the Christian quarters of the old city where the Christian Arabs are still caring for and maintaining the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or Church of Resurrection as they have been doing for hundreds of years. Men were busy washing and scrubbing the entrance to the natural cave they said was the place where Christ Jesus' body was kept after crucifixion and from where the stone was rolled back and resurrection occurred. Also, about 20 feet from the mouth of the natural cave is a rock table upon which they said Jesus' body was washed and prepared for burial. More than 1,000 years after Christ Jesus, the crusaders of the 12th century built a church over the cave and named it the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. A sepulchre is an ancient term which means vault and is used for the burial of a person of honor whom people held in the highest of esteem. Next to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the Mosque of Omar. It is said that the Khalifa Umar Ibn al Qatar, in a visit to Jerusalem was searching for the spot from which the Quran says Prophet Muhammad was taken on the night journey. Islam had not yet arrived in Jerusalem when this revelation was revealed. The Quran says, Glory to Allah, who did take his servant for a journey by night from the sacred mosque to the father's mosque, whose precincts we did bless, so we might show him some of our signs. For he is the one who heareth and seeth things. 17 and 1. Opting not to pray in the church of the Holy Sepulchre for fear that Muslims may not understand, Khalifa Umar prayed outside the church a short distance away. On that spot where he prayed, the Muslims built a mosque and dedicated it in Umar's name. We prayed two rakahs there then began to walk toward the Dome of the Rock. As we made our way across the courtyard and up those many flights of stairs, suddenly, spectacularly, and majestically sitting there before us was the Dome of the Rock Masjid. The Dome of the Rock Masjid is more sacred to Muslims than any site in the world, save two exceptions, the Kaaba and Mecca and Masjid an nabi in Medina, Saudi Arabia. It is here that Prophet Muhammad, according to Quran, 
and the description the prophet gave to Khalifa Umar and others that he ascended to heaven. History records that when Khalifa Umar found this spot, he ordered Abdul Malik Ibn Mawan to build a mosque around it. It took three years to complete. We went to the very spot of the ascension of Prophet Muhammad toward the inside of the masjid and prayed. We returned to the famous Abu Shukri restaurant in the marketplace area of the old city where earlier we enjoyed a delicious Palestinian breakfast. After having tea, we ascended several flights of stairs to the roof of a building overlooking the western wall of the ruins of the old Solomon Temple. It is said that Orthodox Jews consider this wall the holiest spot in all Judaism, which they call the Wailing Wall. After coffee and tea again, vans were waiting to take the delegation to a scheduled press conference and crowds had gathered to see the Muslim American leader. Because of the thickness of the crowd, Imam Muhammad was forced to stop along the way to shake hands and embrace the throngs of people who were in his path. Dozens of news people, U.S. networks, and Palestinian, Israeli, European television, radio, and print media packed the large interview room. Sitting at the table was Sheikh Ekrima Saeed Sabri, Imam of Al-Aqsa Mosque and Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and the Holy Land and the Chief of the Scholars and Preachers Organization. Sitting to the other side was Dr. Ali El Kawasmi, the Palestinian National Authority representative and Minister of Transportation. Dr. Kawasmi and Sheikh Sabri helped to organize Imam Muhammad's visit to Jerusalem. Both addressed the gathering of news people, updating them on their current negotiations with the Israeli government on the horror of its occupation, and then expressed the Palestinians' profound desire for peace. And you, what you have experienced, uh, the status quo concerning between the Palestinians and the Israelis. So how do you regard the negotiations and the peace process which is taking place now in the meantime? Well, it's, it's, it's uh, quite, re quite regretful, it's disturbing that uh, the peace process uh, has to at least be uh, uh, stopped. Because uh, right now I don't think there's any progress for the for the peace talks uh, or the peace negotiations because of the position that uh, uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has taken uh, to give incentives to the uh, settlers. Uh, so the, this is what uh, disturbs the White House, uh, the State Department, uh, for us in the U.S., and it's also very disturbing for Muslims. Imam Muhammad was introduced to the world press as an American Muslim leader whose good works in America are known to them and the Palestinian people who have been praying for his success for years. Imam Muhammad began his comments to the media by thanking the organizing committee for planning his visit and the reception he and his delegation received upon arrival at the airport and at the hotel, and he thanked the Palestinian Authority President Yasser Arafat for extending him the invitation to visit with him at his home in Gaza City. The Imam said that the reception he received in Jerusalem was by far the largest he had ever received. This is a great compliment to the Palestinian people, considering the fact that, as the most effective and compelling Muslim leader in America, Imam Muhammad has traveled to and been received on every populated continent in the world. Imam Muhammad expressed great love and admiration for the Palestinian people that they would achieve peace 
justice and recognition of their homeland rights. Many questions were directed to Imam Muhammad concerning the status quo of the Palestinian people. However, the fact that this was the first full day tempered the Imam's answers since he had not yet visited the occupied areas to see and speak with the people himself. It was nearing the time of Juma. The news conference was ended and we boarded our vehicles and left for Al-Aqsa Mosque for Juma prayer. Following the Juma prayers, which was attended by tens of thousands of people, Imam Muhammad was called upon by the Imam of Al-Aqsa Mosque, Sheikh Sabri, to speak. As he rose to speak, I saw from my vantage point that they had covered his clothing with a speaker's robe, normally used by those who deliver kutbahs in the mosque. Thousands of Muslims remained after Jumaat to hear the Muslim leader from America. The Imam's message to the throngs of Muslims jamming the area where they gave the Friday kutbahs was one of caring and sharing. Their concern was his concern. Their hurt was his hurt and that the message of their concern and hurt would be carried back to the American people and government. He encouraged them to keep the faith and that Allah is creating a new climate by which people's hearts are in the process of changing. He stressed that eventually they will win their right cause. The Palestinian people attending Juma greeted Imam Muhammad's message with thunderous approval. As Imam Muhammad was leaving the Qutbah area of the mosque, Muslims literally swamped him, wanting to shake his hand, talk to him, give him messages to take back to their loved ones in America, and just to simply give him the greetings of Salaam. I cannot adequately describe the spirit, the love, and the admiration of the Palestinian people for Imam Muhammad and Imam Muhammad's love for them, except to say that the scene of thousands of people all trying to get the one man simultaneously is unbelievably overwhelming. Everywhere he went in Jerusalem after his talk in Masjid al-Aqsa, people were stopping him, shaking his hand, embracing him, and kissing him. They kept saying, help us now, let the world know what is happening here. On our way back to the hotel on the Mount of Olives, we suddenly came upon an Israeli army roadblock with scores of Israeli soldiers carrying machine guns. Our guides asked us to accompany them to the demonstration that was taking place above us on the hill. What we saw was a large gathering of people holding a demonstration on one of the lower sides of the Mount of Olives. The people carried signs written in Arabic, English, and Hebrew protesting against the Israeli government for taking poor Palestinian people's land and building accommodations for Israeli immigrants upon them. These Jewish immigrants fleeing from the oppression of other countries are doing the same thing to the Palestinians that they are fleeing from themselves. Only the Palestinians have no place to run. And even if they did, many of them whom I have talked to would rather stay and struggle for the land of their birthright than to run. The ethnic makeup of the demonstrators was a good sign for a change of climate for good in the hearts and minds of people whose cry for freedom and justice cannot be killed. There were Jewish people with Hebrew worded signs. Palestinian people with Arabic worded signs demonstrating together, not against one another. We joined the demonstration. From a rock platform, speaker after speaker, surrounded by machine gun carrying young baby faced Israeli soldiers, 
condemned this new Israeli government's total insensitivity to the Palestinian basic human and God-given legal right to enjoy liberty, to own property, and to the pursuit of happiness. Imam Muhammad met with the organizers of the demonstration on the top of the rock platform and spoke of his concern and hope that the Israeli leader would heed the plea of this diverse crowd, which also included a supportive speaker from the Israeli Knesset. Again, before the cameras and the recorders of the world press, Imam Muhammad declared that the Palestinian people and the Jewish people need peace and the search for peace must be honorable and just for all concerned. We left the demonstration before it was over and returned to the hotel to get ready for the balance of our schedule for that evening. Our schedule was tight and there was little time in our 12 to 15 hour day schedule for rest. We left the hotel at sunset, going to North Jerusalem for a tour of Shufat refugee camp. Upon our arrival, representatives of the camp led us on the tour. It was horrible. Our host, as gracious as they are, still provided a very delicious meal for us on the rooftop eating area under the canopy of a clear starlit sky. So in light of all of their toil and struggles, their spirit was not broken, nor did they have a feeling of hopelessness. Their faith is strong, their resolve is firm, and their optimism is as high as ever. We finished our meal, took some pictures with the residents, said our salams, and left for the hotel. The next day, we were on our way to the city of Hebron to visit the grave site and small mosque built around the tomb of Samuel, one of the many prophets to the Jewish people according to the Old Testament. The place is called Nabi Samuel which is in or near the city of Ramallah. Our guide told us that hundreds of years before Islam came to the area, the Palestinian people were protecting and maintaining the burial sites of these prophets and their families. When Islam came, the Palestinian Muslims continued to protect and maintain these sites. To ensure additional security and protection, they built small mosques around them. Because of the mosque and their sacred use for prayer, worship, and education, the grave sites were considered equally revered and respected. The Israeli people, after all these years of indifference and neglect, now are taking these sites by force from the Palestinian caretakers and destroying the mosque and their sanctity. At the Hebron City Hall, Imam Muhammad and his delegation were met by the mayor and his top aides, along with the Minister of Endowments and his staff. Finding a more impressive group of local officials would be hard. To witness their love, respect, and admiration for Imam Muhammad, a descendant of free people, then slaves, then emancipated people, is a true sign of Allah's handiwork in action in our time, we toured the old city of Hebron, many of the surrounding settlements and the areas, only university, which had been closed by the Israeli government and surrounded by Israeli soldiers. Our delegation arrived at the Haram Ibrahimi Mosque after the noon prayer was completed, partly because of the security forces of the Israeli army. There were two metal detectors stationed outside the masjid, checking Muslims as they entered. Finally, we entered the Ibrahimi Mosque, considered the fourth most sacred to Muslims in the world, and performed our salat. 
there was a large group of Muslims there listening to a midday lecture on Islam, anxiously awaiting to hear Imam Muhammad. Imam Muhammad was introduced as the foremost Muslim American leader visiting Palestine to see firsthand what was happening in their country. They told us that the Haram Ibrahimi Mosque covers the gravesite of Prophet Ibrahim, his wife Sarah, Prophet Jacob, Isaac, and Joseph. Peace be upon the Prophet. For centuries before Islam, Jewish religious authorities neglected this site. But now, suddenly, they are trying to evict the Muslims who have maintained these sites over the years and declared themselves protectors of the Patriots' burial sites. The city of Bethlehem was the next stop and we arrived at City Hall to an awaiting reception by Mayor Fries and his staff accompanied by the local imam. The city was lit up for the Christians celebrating Christmas. After the town hall meeting we toured the world famous places including the Church of the Nativity which is about six miles from Jerusalem. The Church of the Nativity was built over the cattle shed where Christ Jesus was said to have been born. Thousands of Christians were already there awaiting the 25th of December which commenced their celebrations. The Muslims who are in charge of security in Bethlehem did not interfere but only watched and protected the Christians right to worship. After that we visited the Dehishi refugee camp, which was in the direction of Jerusalem. The leaders met Imam Muhammad at the gate, embraced him, and led us on a tour. I have read about these kinds of conditions, but that was about World War II, and they called them concentration camps. The names of the oppressors and victims have changed but the similar treatment remains the same. The last day of our tour of Palestine began with another visit to Ramallah, which is located on the West Bank. At the border limits, a police escort was waiting. With lights flashing and sirens blaring, they whisked us through the city streets to the Abu Raya Center for a meeting with Dr. Ghazi Hanania and his staff. After touring the facility, we left for a meeting with the governor of Ramallah. Imam Muhammad was met at the car and ushered up the stairs to awaiting Governor Abu Firas and staff. The governor embraced Imam Muhammad enthusiastically and welcomed him to Ramallah. He said he wanted him to see what is happening here for himself and offer any advice for resolution. Following a very exciting and inspiring visit, our escort took us to a facility that teaches and trains the disabled. The official staff at the Family Rehabilitation Society facility took the delegation on a tour of the different wards where the blind, the paralyzed, the recovering sick, and those with limbs missing are retrained in useful vocations. The doctors reported that one Israeli tactic was to aim at the spine. That type of wound paralyzes the body. We ate lunch at the facility and were taken to the Palestinian radio and television headquarters for an interview by the reporters there of Imam Muhammad. The director of the station interrupted regular programming for a news special. Imam Muhammad, leader of Muslims in America, and Aisha Mustafa, editor of the Muslim Journal, was at the station and had consented to be interviewed. The interviewer began by saying, We know who you are, Imam Muhammad. We are proud of you. Your visit empowers our work. Our strength is eternally connected.
Imam Muhammad greeted the listening audience and assured them they would win their cause soon. From Ramallah to Nablus, we were given a spectacular view of the Palestinian countryside. Their greatest resource is its agricultural yield. Rows of olive trees wrapping around hills of fertile land, flush and luscious. Arriving at Nablus was an event. The reception area exploded with music, played by the school band of uniformed students. Cheers and applause greeted Imam Muhammad as he alighted from the lead car and walked up to a long line of dignitaries and happy people waiting to greet him. The crowd of people engulfed him, shaking his hands and embracing him with some of the warmest expressions of sincere affection I have ever seen. When he addressed this inquisitive audience and answered questions, he spoke of being overwhelmed by the receptions he had received everywhere in Palestine and never had he experienced such receptions before. Finally, we were off to Gaza and a meeting with the Palestinian Authority President. On our way through Israeli-occupied territory, we saw acres and acres of fruit trees and thousands of acres of farmland being ready for crop planting and scores of American-style farm homes sitting on hilltops overlooking newly plowed fields and other fields of crops already growing on once Palestinian-owned lands. A private car was awaiting at the checkpoint with a military escort to take Imam Muhammad to the presidential office of Yasser Arafat. Entering the president's office, President Arafat embraced Imam Muhammad and in perfect English said, Welcome Imam Muhammad to Gaza. President Arafat's private meeting with Imam Muhammad is of such magnitude that the world will never forget it. After lunch and many pictures, President Arafat walked Imam Muhammad to his waiting car, embraced him, and closed the door waving goodbye to a person he called a friend and... <laughs>